I mostly read public domain books here on Glenn Reads Books to You, and they were written a long time ago, so they're usually racist or sexist or bigoted. But in there somewhere is a story, and uh, that's why those stories are famous. Other times, I read works from independent authors, and they're delightfully not racist. But they might have uh, adult language or adult situations, like, uh, oh, I don't know, making sex. Uh, So that's your warning. But I'm sure you've grown up enough to handle it. Uh, Don't write to me complaining. The hell kind of cat gets a slip disc? I've never heard of that before. Cat with a back problem? Oh, god damn it! All right. Go on, take a seat, you little idiot. Uh, uh, welcome to the Glenn Reads Books to You Mansion. It's a fun little bit where I pretend to live in a mansion and not just recording in my basement. This is where I read the hottest public domain books and short stories. Uh, this week, we're going to read uh, Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. Uh, you want to learn more about the author? Sure. Uh, I stole all this from Wikipedia. Robert Louis Balfour Stevenson, thank God he got rid of that, uh, was born the 13th of November, 1850, and he died the 3rd of December, 1894. He was a Scottish novelist, uh, an essayist, a poet, and a travel writer. Oh, that's boring, travel writer, honestly. He is best known for works such as Treasure Island, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, uh, Kidnapped, and A Child's Garden of Verses. Born and educated in Edinburgh, Stevenson suffered from serious bronchial trouble for much of his life, but he continued to write prolifically and travel widely in defiance of his poor health. He settled in Samoa, where, alarmed at the increasing European and American influence in the South Sea, uh, he, his writing turned from romance and adventure fiction towards a darker realism. He died of a stroke uh, in his island home in 1894 at the age of 44. Want to hear some fun facts that I stole from Scotsman.com? Sure, Scotsman.com slash arts and culture. Uh, He kind of invented the sleeping bag. Yeah, look at him. Stevenson was as good a claim as any to inventing the snug camping necessity (laughs) in travels with a donkey in uh, surveys, whatever. Uh, One of his earliest works, Stephen talks of crafting a quote-unquote sleeping sack, uh, which has six uh, six feet square in size, large enough that it had to be transported by donkey, made of green waterproof cart cloth without, uh, and blue sheep's fur within. And ne- he nearly died before writing his most famous works. Despite uh, baffling, uh, battling with tuberculosis for most of his adult life, a, a bout of malaria nearly killed Stevenson in California uh, shortly before his marriage to Fanny Vandergrift in Osborne in 1880. This bout of poor health preceded some of his most iconic works, including Treasure Island in 1882 and The, and the Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in 1886. Uh, I'm just rifling through these. Uh, half of his original manuscripts are currently lost. Half of Stevenson's original manuscripts are currently missing. The manuscripts are believed to have been sold off by the Scots writer's descendants around, uh, oh, I don't know, World War I, a time which saw the writer's works uh, fall out of fashion. Among the missing works are the original copies of The Black Arrow and The Master of Ballantry and Treasure Island. Got time for another one before the grandfather clock goes off telling me to shut up so we can read the story? Sure. Oh, oh, well, there you go. Well, in other news, my cat has back problems. I just took him to the vet and they said, yeah, he's got back problems. He's old, like a middle-aged man who used to do construction. Now he's got back problems. So there you go, a little tidbit of my personal life. Why don't we get into the story? Okay, why don't you get yourself settled, eh? Huh? Here in my library of my mansion. It's a whole bit. It's a whole bit I've been doing for years. Part one, the old buccaneer. The first chapter, the old sea dog at the Admiral Benbow. Squire Talani, Dr. Livesey, and the rest of these gentlemen having asked me to write down the whole particulars of the Treasure Island uh, from the beginning to the end, keeping nothing back but the bearings of the island. And that is only because there's still treasure not yet lifted. Uh, I take up my pen in the year of the grace something. I don't know what the hell that's supposed to be. 
they're being vague. It's uh, kind of like the letter I curved weirdly and a V with a big dash. I don't know what that's supposed to be. And go back uh, to the time when my father kept the Admiral Benbow in. And the old brown, uh, the brown old seaman with the saber cut first uh, took up his lodging under our roof. I remember him oh, as if it were yesterday. As he came plodding to the inn door, his sea chest following behind him in a hand barrow, a tall, strong, heavy, nut brown man, and it, I hope this doesn't get racist, and his terry pigtail falling over the shoulder of his soiled blue coat, his hands ragged and scarred, with black, broken nails, and the saber cut across one cheek, a dirty, livid white. I remember him looking round the cover and whistling to himself as he did so, and, and then breaking out eh, in an old sea song that he sang so often afterwards. Ah, eh, fifteen men on a dead man's chest, yo-ho-ho, and a bottle of rum. In the high, old, tottering voice that seemed to have been turned and broken at the captain's bars, then he rapped on the door with a bit of a stick, like a hand spike that he carried, and uh, when my father appeared, calling roughly for a glass of rum, uh, this, when it was brought to him, he drank slowly, like a, like a connoisseur, lingering on the taste and still looking about him at the cliffs and up on, on our sideboard. Well, it's a... Is a handy cove, he says at length. Oh, I, I had a pleasant uh, city, cityated grog shop. Oh, much company made. Uh, my father told him no, uh, very little company. Oh, the more was the pity. Well, well, then he said, this is the birth for me. Here you, matey, he cried to the man who trundled barrel. Bring up alongside and help up my chest and I'll stay here a bit, he continued. I'm a, hmm, a plain man. Rum and bacon and eggs is what I want. Oh, and that head up there uh, for to watch ships off. Uh, what you uh, mought call me, you mought call me captain. Oh, I see that you're at uh, there. And he threw down one, uh, three, uh, four pieces of gold on the threshold. Uh, you can tell me what I've worked through that, he says, looking as fierce as the commander. And indeed, Battis' closed were, and as coarsely as he spoke, he had none of the appearance of a man who had sailed before the mast, but seemed like a mate or a skipper accustomed to be obeyed or to strike. The man who came with the barrow told us that the mail had set down the next morning before the Royal George, and that he had inquired what inns uh, there were along the coast, and hearing ours, well spoke of, I suppose, and described as lonely, uh, he had chosen it from the others for this place of residence, and uh, that was all that we could learn from our guest. Ah, uh, he was a very silent man by custom. Eh? Uh, and all day he hung around the cove and upon our cliffs with a brass telescope. All evening he sat in a corner of the parlor next to the fire uh, and drank rum uh, and water very strong. What the? Was the water strong? Uh, and mostly he would not speak when spoken to and only look up sudden and fierce and blow through his nose like a, like a, like a, like a foghorn. And then we had people who came about our house soon and learned to let him be. Every day when he came back from his stroll, he would ask if any seafaring men had gone along the road. And at first we thought it was uh, the, the want of company of his own kind that made him ask this question. Uh, but at last we began to see that uh, he was desirous to avoid them. When a seaman did uh, put up at the Admiral Benbow, as now, as some did, asking by the uh, coast road for Bristol, oh, he would look in at him uh, through the curtain door before he entered the parlor. Oh, he was always sure to be as silent as a mouse when any such was present. For me, at least, well, there's no secret in the matter, for I was, in a way, a sharer in his alarms. He had taken me aside one day and promised me a silver fourpenny uh, uh, on the first of every month if I would uh, only keep my weather eye open for a seafaring man with one leg uh, and let him know uh, what the moment it happened. Often enough, uh, when the first of the month came round, I applied to him for my wage, and he would only blow through his nose at me eh, and stare me down. Uh, but before the week was out, he was sure to think better of it. Bring me my four-penny piece and repeat his orders to look out for the quote-unquote seafaring man uh, with one leg. How that parsonage haunted my dreams, I need scarcely tell you. On stormy nights, when the wind, sh uh, the wind shook the four corners of the house and the surf roared along the cove and, and eh, I don't know. 
up the cliffs. Now, I would see him in a thousand forms, and with a thousand diabolical expressions. And now the leg would be cut off at the knee, now at the hip. Now uh, he was a monstrous kind of creature that uh, uh, never had but one leg. Uh, the, really? Just you're born without a leg and now you're a monstrous creature? And in the middle of his body, oh, 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 to see him leap and run and pursue me over the hedge and the ditch was the worst of nightmares. Uh, and altogether, I paid a pretty dear for my monthly four penny piece in the shape of these abominable fancies. Uh, but though I was terrified by the idea of a seafaring man with one leg, I was far less afraid of the captain himself than anybody else who knew him. Well, there were nights when he took a deal more rum and water uh, than his head would carry. And then he would sometimes sit and sing his wicked old wild sea songs, minding nobody. Oh, but sometimes he would call for glasses round and force all the trembling company to listen to his stories or, or uh, bear a chorus to his singing. Often I have heard the house shaking with yo-ho-ho and a bottle of rum. Eh, oh, that's a classic. And all the neighbors joining for dear life. Oh, with the fear of death upon them, and each singing louder than the other to avoid remark. For in these fits, he was the most overriding companion ever known. Oh, he'd slap his hand on the table for silence all around. Oh, he'd fly up in a passion of anger at any question, or sometimes uh, uh, because uh, one was uh, none was put. Oh, and then he'd judge the company was not following the story, nor he would allow anyone, anyone, to leave the inn till he had drunk himself sleepy and reeled off to bed. Well, his uh, stories were what frightened most people of all. Uh, dreadful stories they were about hanging, eh? walking the plank, eh? storms at sea, and the dry tortugas, wild deeds and places on the Spanish main. And by his own account, he must have uh, lived uh, his life among some of the wickedest men that God had ever allowed upon a sea. And the language in which he told these stories shocked our plain country people almost as much as, as, much as the crimes that he described. But my father was always saying that the inn would be ruined. For people would soon cease coming there to be tyrannized over and put down again and, and sent shivering to their beds. But I really believe his presence did us good. Oh, people were frightened at the time, but uh, looking back, they rather liked it. Oh, it's a fine excitement in a quiet country life. And there was even a party of younger men who pretended to admire him, calling him a, 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 a quote, true sea dog, huh? and a, quote, a, a real old salt, and such names like, and, and saying that there was a sort of man that made England terrible at sea. In one way, indeed, he bid fair to ruin us. Oh, he kept on staying week after week, eh? and last month after month, so that all the money had long been exhausted, and still my father never plucked up a heart to insist on having more. If I ever mentioned it, the captain blew through his nose so loudly that you may have said that he, he roared hmm? and stared my poor father out of the room. I have seen him wring his hands after such a rebuff, and I am sure the annoyance and the terror he lived in must have greatly hastened his early and unhappy death. Well, there's foreshadowing. All the time he lived with us, the captain made no change whatsoever to his dress or to buy stockings from a hawker. Uh, uh, what are the cocks? In his hat having fallen down, he let it hang from that day forth, though it was a great annoyance when it blew. And I remember the appearance of his coat, which uh, he patched himself upstairs in his room, and which before the end was nothing but patches. He never wrote or received a letter. He never uh, spoke with any of the neighbors. And with these, for the most part, uh, only when drunk on rum... Oh, uh, the great sea chest none of us had ever seen open. Oh, uh, he was uh, only uh, once crossed, and that was towards the end when my poor father was far gone in decline, and that took him off. Oh, Dr. Livesey came late one afternoon to see the patient, uh, took a bit of dinner from my mother, and went into the parlor to smoke a pipe until his horse uh, should come down from the hamlet. We, uh, for we had no stabling in the old Benbow, Oh, I followed him in, and I remember observing the contrast, uh, the neat, 
bright doctor with his powder as white as snow and his bright black eyes and pleasant manners made the heavy, coltish country folk, and above all, uh, with that filthy, heavy, bleared scarecrow, a pirate of ours, uh, sitting far gone and rum, with his arms on the table, suddenly he, Dash, the captain that is, Dash, began to pipe up from his eternal song. Fifteen men on the dead man's chest, Yo-ho-ho, and a bottle of rum. Drink, and the devil had done for the rest. Yo-ho-ho, and a bottle of rum. At first, at first, I had supposed the dead man's chest had to be that identical big box of his upstairs in the front room, and the thought had been mingled in my nightmares. And with that of the one-legged seafaring man, and by this time we had all long ceased to pay any particular notice of the song, uh, it was new to, to that night, uh, to nobody but to Dr. Livesey, and uh, on him I observed it did not produce an agreeable effect, for he looked up from this uh, moment quite angrily before he went on with his talk to the old tailor, uh, the gardener, uh, on a new cure for rheumatics. In the meantime, the captain gradually brightened up at his own music, and at last flapped his hand upon the table before him in a way that we all knew to mean silence. The voices stopped at once, and all but Dr. Livesey's, and he went on before speaking clear and kind to the drawing briskly of his pipe between every word or two. Uh, yeah, yeah, Captain glared at him for a while, eh, flapped his hand again, glared still harder, and at last uh, broke out with a villainous low oath. Silence there, between decks. Uh, yeah, yeah, we, uh, we addressing me? Sir, says the doctor, and when the ruffian had told him with a, another oath that this was so, I have only uh, one thing to say to you, sir, replies the doctor, that if you keep on drinking rum, eh, the world will soon be quit of a dirty scoundrel. Oh, the old fellow, that was fury, was awful. Oh, he sprang to his feet and drew and opened a sailor's clasp knife and balanced it open on the palm of his hand and threatened to pin the doctor to the wall. The doctor never so much as moved. He spoke to him as before, over his shoulder, and in the same tone of voice, rather high, so that all in the room might hear, but perfectly calm and steady. If you, if you do not put your knife this instant in your pocket, well, I promise, on my honor, you shall hang at next Assises. Uh, then followed a battle of looks between them. Uh, but the captain soon knuckled under, uh, put up his weapon, and resumed his seat, grumbling like a beaten dog. Now, sir, continued the doctor, since I know how there's such a fellow in my district, you may count. I'll have an eye upon you day and night. I'm not a doctor only. Yeah. I'm a magistrate, and if I catch a breath of complaint against you, if it's only for a piece of incivility like tonight's, oh, I'll take an effectual means to have you hunted down and routed out of this. Let that suffice. Soon after, Dr. Livesey's horse came to the door and rode away, but the captain held his peace that evening and for many evenings to come. Chapter 2 uh, Black Dog appears uh, and disappears. It was not very long after this that there occurred the first of mysterious uh, events that rid us at last of the captain. Though not, as you will see, of his affairs, how oh, it was a bitter, cold winter with a long, hard frost uh, and heavy gales, and it was plain from the first that my poor father was little likely to see the spring. He sank daily, and my mother and I had all the inn upon our hands, and were kept busy enough without uh, paying much regard for the unpleasant crest. Uh, it was one January morning, very early, a pinching, eh, frosty morning, uh, at the cove, all gray with, with hoar frost, uh, the ripple lapping softly on the stones, the sun still low, and only touching the hilltops and shining far to the seaward. Uh, the captain had risen earlier than usual and set out down the beach, his cutlass swinging under the broad skirts of the old blue coat, his brass telescope under his arm, and his hat tilted back upon his head. I remember his breath hanging like smoke in the wake as he strode off. And the last sound I heard of him as he turned the big rock was a loud snort of indignation, as though his mind was still running upon Dr. Livesey. 
Well, Mother was upstairs with Father, and I was laying the breakfast table against the captain's return when the parlor door opened, and a man stepped in, on whom I had never set my eyes before. Oh, he was pale, tallowy creature, wanting two fingers in the left hand. Wanting two fingers left hand, but he's missing them? And though he wore a cutlass, he did not look uh, much like a fighter. I had always uh, my eye for us, open for seafaring men with one leg or two. And I remember this one puzzled me. Well, he's not salutary, and yet he had a smack of the sea about him, too. I asked him uh, what uh, was for his service. And he said that he would uh, eh, take rum. But as I was going out of the room to Fetch it, he sat down upon the table and motioned me to draw near. I paused where I was with my napkin in my hand. Uh, come here, Sonny, he says. Come near here. Yeah, don't go near him. I took a step near. Yeah, don't go near him. Is uh, this here table for my mate Bill, he asked with a kind of leer. I told him I did not know his mate Bill. Burp. And this was for a person who stayed in our house for whom the captain called. Uh, well, said he, my mate Bill would be called the captain. As like it not, uh, he has a cut on one cheek and a mighty pleasant way about him. Particularly in drink, yeah, uh, as my mate Bill. Oh, well, well, put it uh, for argument like that your captain has a cut on one cheek. And uh, we'll put it, if you like, that that uh, cheek's the right one. Huh? Ah, well, I told you. Uh, now, is my mate Bill here in this house? And I told him he was out walking. Uh, which way, Sonny? Which way is he gone? And when I pointed out the rock and told him how the captain was likely to return and how soon, he answered a few other questions. Ah, said he, ah, this would be as good as a drink for my mate Bill. The expression of his face as he had said these words was not at all pleasant. And I uh, had my own reasons for thinking that the stranger was mistaken. Even supposing he meant that he said uh, that he had uh, no affair of mine, I thought. And besides, it was difficult uh, uh, to know what to do. And the stranger kept hanging about just inside the end door, uh, peering round the corner like a cat, waiting for a, wait, uh, wait, waiting for a mouse. And once I stepped out myself into the road, but he immediately called me back. And as I did not obey quick enough for his fancy, a most horrible change came over his tallowy face. I ordered me in with an oath that made me jump. As soon as I was back again, he returned to his former manner, half fawning, eh? half sneering, eh? patted me on the shoulder, eh? and told me that I was a, 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 a good boy and he had taken quite a fancy to me. I have a son of my own, he said, as like you as two blocks, eh? and he's all the pride of my art. Uh, but he has a great thing for boys is discipline, sonny, discipline. Now, if you had sailed along a bill, uh, you wouldn't have stood there to be spoke to twice, not you. Oh, that was never Bill's way, nor the way of Sitch as sailed with him. And here, sure enough, is my mate Bill, with a spyglass under his arm. Bless his old art, to be sure. Oh, you and me'll just go back into the parlor, Sonny, uh, and get behind the uh, get behind the door, and then we'll give uh, we'll give Bill a little surprise, huh? Bless his art, I say again. So saying. The stranger backed along with me into the parlor and put me behind him in the corner so that we were uh, both hidden by the open door. Oh, I, I was very uneasy and alarmed, as you may fancy, and it rather added to my fears to observe that the stranger was certainly frightened himself. Oh, he cleared the hilt of his cutlass. Oh, and he loosened the blade of his sheath. And all the time we were waiting there, he kept swallowing as if he felt that what we used to call, what we used to call a lump in the throat. Well, that seems a good place to take a little break. Um, oh, boy, pirates, huh? <laughs> pirates, pirates are fun. Uh, why don't we uh, get away from this environment with these sweaty pirates, these wet, sweaty pirates. They probably never wash, probably got a lot of dirt in their faces, huh? dirt under their nails. Gross. I hate the whole thing. It makes me feel gross. We need to go someplace clean. And that place would be my basement sitting underneath uh, uh, two naked light bulbs where I could play a uh, guitar to you and tell you about the latest upcoming book from Penguin Random House.
Oh, there you are. Why don't you take a seat here, this folding chair, underneath this naked light bulb. As I stand under this naked light bulb, over here, and play guitar to you. I love playing guitar in my basement. As I tell you about the latest book from Penguin Random House, uh, The First Fast Draw, a novel by Louis L'Amour. The categories are Western fiction. You want to hear about it? Sure you do. East Texas wasn't much of a home for Cullen Baker. Few liked him. Uh, some even tried to, tried to kill him. Yet after three hard years of wandering, he's come back to farm the land that's rightfully his. Only Cullen's in for an unwelcome homecoming. His neighbors, uh, yeah, have long memories, uh, uh, the Reconstructionists have greedy hearts. And his worst enemy is teamed up with the vicious outlaw. But Cullen isn't about to back down, huh? Instead, he's intent on perfecting a new way of gunfighting. The fast draw. Oh, this is the invention of the fast draw? He's writing about the invention of the fast draw? This is amazing historical fiction. And now, with enemies closing in on three sides and threatening the woman he loves, he'll have to be faster than lightning and twice as deadly just to survive. Well, that's uh, The First Fast Draw, a novel by Louis L'Amour. Category, Western fiction and historical fiction. Uh, you can get this at Amazon for eight ninety nine as paperback. You can get it from Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, Bookshop.org, Hudson Booksellers, Powell's Target, and you know people are going to be trying to invent new ways for gunslinging in the hollowed aisles of Walmart. Well, with that, uh, why don't we go back upstairs and uh, learn more about pirates. Now, well, there you are. Why don't you get yourself all settled? <clears throat> yeah, you kind of like the basement, don't you? Yeah, a lot of people get weirded out by the basement, but you get it. You get the basement. You understand why it's such a fun place to hang out. Burp. Uh, let's continue. At last, in strode the captain, slammed the door behind him without looking to the left or right, and marched straight across the room to where his breakfast awaited him. Bill, said the stranger in a voice that I uh, thought he had uh, tried to make bold and big. The captain spun around on his heel and fronted us. All the brown had gone out of his face, and uh, even his nose was blue. He had the look of a man who sees a ghost, or the evil one, or something worse, uh, if anything can be. And upon my word, I felt sorry to see him in a moment turn so old and sick. Come, Bill, you know me. You know an old shipmate, Bill, surely, said the stranger. Oh, the captain made a sort of gasp. Black dog, he said. Ah, and who else? Returned the other, getting more at his ease. Black dog as ever was. Come uh, for to see his old shipmate Billy at the Admiral Bembo Inn. Ah, Bill, Bill, we have seen a sight of times, us two, since I lost them two talons, holding up his mutilated hand. Oh, now, uh, look here, said the captain. You've run me down. Uh, here I am. Well, then, speak up. What is it? That's you, Bill, returned Black Dog. You're in the right of it, Billy. I'll have a glass of rum from this dear child here, as I've uh, took such a like to. And uh, we'll sit down, if you please, and talk square. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> like old shipmates? When I returned with the rum, they were already seated on either side of the captain's breakfast table. Uh, Black Dog, next to the door, and sitting sideways so as to have one eye on his old shipmate and one, as I thought, on his retreat. Oh, he bade me go and leave the door wide open. None of your keyholes for me, Sonny, <laughs> he said as I left them together and retired into the bar. For a long time, though, I certainly did my best to listen. I could hear nothing but low gatling, but at the last the voices began to grow higher and I could pick up a word or two, uh, mostly oaths <laughs> from the captain. Uh, no, 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 uh, and an end of it. He cried once, and again, Oh, if it comes to swinging, swing away, say I. Well, then all of a sudden, there was a tremendous explosion of oaths eh, and other noises. Then the chair and the table went over in a lump. Uh, a clash of steel followed, and then a cry of pain. And the next instant, I saw a black dog in, in full flight. 
Oh, and the captain highly pursuing, and both with a uh, drawn cutlass, oh, and the former streaming blood from his left shoulder, just as the door of the captain aimed at the fugitive one last tremendous cut, yeah, which would certainly have split him into a chine had it not been intercepted by our big signboard of Admiral Bembo. Oh, you may see a notch on the lower side of the frame to this day. That blow was the last of the battle. Once out upon the road, Black Dog, in spite of his wound, uh, showed a wonderful clean pair of heels, eh? and disappeared over the edge of the hill in half a minute. But well, the captain, for his part, stood staring at the signboard like a, eh, a bewildered man. Then he passed his hand over his eyes several times, and at last turned back into the house. Jim, says he, rum. And as he spoke, he reeled a little and caught himself with uh, one hand against the wall. Uh, are you hurt? I cried. Uh, rum, he repeated. I must get away from here. Rum, rum. And I ran to fetch it. Oh, but I was quite unsteady by all that had fallen out. And I uh, broke one glass and fouled the tap. And while I was still getting in my own way, I heard a loud fall in the parlor. And running in, I beheld the captain laying full length upon the floor. Oh, at the same instant, my mother, alarmed by the cries of the fighting, came running downstairs to help me. And between us, uh, we raised his head, and he was breathing very loud and, 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 and hard, and his eyes were closed. Oh, and his face, uh, a horrible color. Oh, dear, deary me, cried my mother. What a disgrace upon this house, and your poor father sick. In the meantime... Now, we had no idea what to do to help the captain, nor any other thought, uh, but that he had uh, gotten his, uh, his death hurt in the scuffle with the stranger. Oh, I got the rum, to be sure, and I tried to put it down his throat, but his, his teeth were tightly shut, and his jaws, oh, his jaws as strong as iron. Oh, I was happy, a relief for us, when the door opened, and the doctor lives, he came in, and on a visit with my father. Oh, doctor, we cried, what shall we do? Where is he wounded? Wounded? A uh, fiddlestick's end, said the doctor. No more wounded than you or I. Ah, uh, the man has had a stroke, as I warned him. Now, Mrs. Hawkins, just you run upstairs to your husband and tell him, if possible, nothing about it. Uh, for my part, I must do my best to save this fellow's trebly worthless life. Jim, you get me a basin. Uh, when I got back with the basin, the doctor had already ripped up the captain's sleeve and exposed his great sinewy arm. Oh, it was tattooed in several places. Here's luck, a fair wind, and Billy Bones his fancy, which were very neatly and clearly executed upon the forearm. And uh, up near the shoulder, there's a, eh, eh, a sketch for gallows and a man hanging from it. Uh, done, as I thought, with great spirit. Prophetic, said the doctor, touching this picture with his finger. And now, Master Billy Bones, if th uh, that be your name... Uh, we'll have a look at this color of your blood, Jim, uh, he said. Are you afraid of blood? Uh, no, sir, said I. Well, then, said he, uh, you hold the basin. With that, he took the lancet and opened a vein. Oh, a great deal of blood was taken before the captain opened his eyes and looked mistily about him. Oh, first he recognized the doctor with an unmistakable frown, and his glance fell upon me. And he looked relieved, but suddenly his color changed. He tried to raise himself, crying, uh, 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 where's Black Dog? Uh, there is no Black Dog here, said the doctor, except what you have on your own back. Uh, you've been drinking rum. You've had a stroke, precisely as I told you. And I have just, very much against my own will, dragged you, head foremost, out of the grave. Now, uh, Mr. Bones, well, that's not my name, he interrupted. Uh, much I care, returned the doctor, is the name of a buccaneer of my acquaintance, and I'll call you by it for the sake of shortness. And what I uh, have to say to you is this. One glass of rum won't kill you, but if you take one, you'll take another and another, and uh, I stake my wig. Eh? If you don't break off this short, you'll die. Do you understand that? Die. <clears throat> and go to your own place. Uh, like the man in the Bible. Uh, come now and make an effort. I'll help you to bed for once. Between us, with much trouble, we managed to hoist him upstairs and laid him on his bed, where his uh, head fell back on the pillow as if he were, oh, almost fainting. Uh, now mind you, said the doctor, I clear my conscience. The name of rum for you is death. And with that, he went off to see my father, taking with me him by the arm. 
Uh, this is nothing, he said as soon as we had closed the door. I have drawn blood enough to keep him quiet for a while, and he should lie eh, for a week where he is. Uh, that is the best thing for him and you, uh, but another stroke will settle him. Did he draw the blood just to get the guy to shut up? Is that what that is? Like, ah, let's just get him to stop bothering you here and you're in. Uh, I'll just drain a lot of his blood <laughs> so he's just laying around and can't do much. Uh, chapter 3, The Black Spot. About noon, I stopped at the captain's door with some cooling drinks eh, and medicines, and he was lying very much as we had left him, only a little higher, and he seemed both weak and excited. Jim, he said, you're the only one that's worth anything, and you know I've always been good to you, uh, never a month, but I've uh, given you a silver four penny for yourself, and now, you see, mate, I'm pretty low, oh, and deserted by all, and Jim, you'll bring me one noggin of rum now, won't you, matey? The doctor, I began, but he broke in, cursing the doctor in a, in a feeble voice, but hardly. Doctors are all swabs, he said. Oh, and that doctor there, why, uh, oh, what are you doing with, uh, with uh, seafaring men? Oh, I've been in places hot as pitch. Uh, and mates dropping around with yellow jack. Uh, and blessed land a heaving like a sea with earthquakes. But, uh, what do the doctor know of lands like that? And I've lived on rum, I tell you. It's been meat and drink, gross, and man and wife, weird, to me. And if uh, I'm not to have my rum now, I'm a poor old hulk on a lee shore. My blood'll be on you, Jim. And that doctor's a swab. He ran on again for a while with curses. Look, uh, look, Jim, now, uh, how my fingers fidgets? Huh? He continued in a pleading tone. I, I can't keep him still. Now, I, I, I haven't had a drop this blessed day, and that doctor's a fool, I tell you. And if I, if I don't have a drain of rum, Jim, oh, oh, I'll have the horrors. I've seen some of them already. I've seen old Flint in the corner there behind you, just as plain as print. Now, I've seen him, and if I get the horrors, I'm, oh, I'm a man has lived rough, and I'll raise Cain. Huh? Yeah. And your doctor himself said one glass wouldn't hurt me. Oh, I'll give you a golden guinea for a noggin, Jim. Well, he was growing more and more excited. Oh, and this alarmed me for my father, who was uh, uh, very low uh, that day and needed quiet. Besides, I was reassured by the doctor's words, uh, now quoted to me and rather offend uh, by the offer of a bribe. I, uh, I want none of your money, said I, but what you owe my father, I'll get you one glass and no more. When I brought it to him, he seized it greedily and drank it out. Aye, aye, he said. Ah, oh, that's some better, sure enough. And now, matey, did that doctor say how long I had to lie here in this old berth? Ah, <clears throat> uh, ooh, ooh, a week at least, said I. Ah, thunder, he cried. A week? Well, I can't do that. They have the black spot on me by then. The lubbers is going about to get the wind of me, bless this moment. Lubbers, as couldn't keep what they got and want to nail what's as another's, eh? Is that seemingly behavior now? I want to know. Oh, oh, but I'm saving soul. I've never wasted good money of mine, nor lost it neither. And I'll trick him again. I'm not afraid of him. I'll shake out another reef, matey, and daddle him again. Weird. What's daddle mean? I'm not going to look that up. As he was thus speaking, he had risen from bed with great difficulty, holding to my shoulder with a grip uh, that almost made me cry out and moving his legs so much, uh, dead weight. His words, spirited as if they, uh, they were in beating, contrasted sadly with the weakness of his voice in which they were uttered. He paused when he had got to a sitting position on the edge. Ah, that, that doctor's done me, he murmured. My ears is singing. Lay me back. Before I could do much to help him, he had fallen back again to his former place. Where you? Lay for a while, silent. Uh, Jim, he said at length. Eh... Uh, you saw that seafaring man today? A black dog, I asked. Ah, black dog, says he. Oh, he's a bad un, eh? Uh, but there's worse than uh, put him on. Uh, now, if I can't get away no how, and they tip me the black spot, mind you, it's an old sea chest thereafter, uh, you get on a horse. Uh, you can, can't you? Well, then uh, you get on a horse and you go, yes. Well, yes, I will. Uh, to that doctor, the eternal doctor, Swab, and tell him to pipe all hands, magistrates and sitch. Oh, and he'll lay him abroad for the Admiral Benbow and all Flint's crew, man and boy, all of them on that's left. 
Uh, I was first mate, I was. Old Flint's first mate, and I'm the only one as knows the place. Oh, he give me a savannah, and when we lay a, a dying, like as I was to now, you see, uh, but you won't uh, peach unless they get the black spot on me, or unless you can see that uh, black dog again, or a seafaring man with one leg, eh, Jim, up him above all. Oh, but, uh, uh, but what's the black spot? Yeah, Captain, I asked. Oh, that's a summons, mate. Oh, I'll tell you what they get that. Uh, they, they keep your weather eye open, Jim, and I'll share with you equals upon my honor. I uh, wandered a little longer, uh, his voice growing weaker, but as soon as I had given him his medicine, which he it took like a child with the remark, Oh, if ever a seaman wanted drugs, it's me. He fell into a heavy, swoon-like sleep in which I left him, but what I should have done had uh, all gone well, I do not know. Probably I should have uh, told the whole story to the doctor, for I was in mortal fear, lest the uh, captain should repent of his confessions and make an end of me. But as things uh, fell out, my poor father died quite suddenly that evening. Which uh, put all other matters on one side. Oh, our natural distress, the visits of neighbors, the arranging of a funeral, and all the work of the inn to be carried on in the meanwhile. Eh, It kept me so busy that I scarcely had time to think of the captain, uh, far less to be afraid of him. Yeah, He got downstairs the next morning, to be sure. And had his meals as usual, though he ate little and had more, I'm afraid, than his usual supply of uh, rum, for he helped himself out of the bar, scowling and blowing through his nose, and uh, though no one dared to cross him, uh, on the night before the funeral, uh, he was as drunk as ever, and it was shocking in that house of mourning to hear him singing away in his ugly old sea song. But weak as he was, we were all in fear of death for him. And uh, the doctor was suddenly taken up with the case many miles away. It was never near the house and after my father's death. Uh, I have said the captain was weak, and indeed, uh, he seemed rather to grow weaker than regain strength. He clambered up and uh, down the stairs and went from parlor to the bar and uh, back again. Sometimes uh, he put his nose out of doors to, to, to smell the sea holding onto the walls as he went for support and breathing hard and fast like a man on a steep mountain. He uh, never particularly addressed me, and it is my belief he has had as good as forgotten his confidences. But here, oh, oh, his temper was more flighty, eh? and allowing for his bodily weaknesses more violent than ever. He had an alarming way now when he was drunk of drawing his cutlass eh? and laying it bare before him on the table. But with all that, he minded people less and and seemed to shut up at his own thoughts and rather wandering. Uh, Once, for instance, uh, to our extreme wonder, he he piped up uh, to a different air, uh, a kind of country love song that he must have learned in his youth before he began to follow the sea. Uh, So things passed until one day after the funeral and about uh, three o'clock, a bitter, foggy, frosty afternoon, I was standing at the door uh, for a moment full of sad thoughts eh, about my father Uh, when I saw someone drawing slowly near the road. Oh, he was plainly blind, for he tapped for him with the stick eh, and wore a great green shade over his eyes and nose, and he was hunched as if uh, with age or weakness and wore a huge old tattered sea cloak with a hood that made him appear positively deformed. I never saw in my life a more dreadful figure. He stopped a little from the inn and raised his voice in an odd uh, eh, sing-song, Address the air in front of him. He was any kind friend and form a poor blind man who has lost his precious sight of his eyes and the gracious def- defiance of his defense of his native country, England. Yeah, and God bless King George. Where or in this part of the country may he be now? Uh, yeah, you're in the Admiral Benbow. <clears throat> Black Hill Cove, my good man, said I. Yeah, oh, 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 I hear a voice, said he. I, a young voice. Will you give me your hand? my kind young friend, and lead me in. I held up my hand, and the horrible soft-spoken eyeless creature gripped it in a moment like a a vice. I was so much startled that I struggled to withdraw. But the blind man pulled me up close to him with a single action of his arm. Now, now, boy, he said, take me to the captain. Uh, Sir, said I, Upon my word, I dare not. Oh, he sneered. That's it. Take me straight in or I'll break your arm. And he gave it as he spoke, a wrench that made me cry out, Sir, I said, 
It is for yourself, I mean. The captain is not what he used to be. He sits with the drawn cutlass, another gentleman. Oh, come now, march on, he interrupted me. I ain't never heard a voice so cruel and cold and ugly as that blind man's. And it cowed me more than the pain. And I began to obey him at once, walking straight in the door and toward the parlor where the our old sick buccaneer was sitting dazed with rum. The blind man clung close to me, holding me with one iron fist and leaning almost more of his weight on me than I could carry out, lead me straight to him, and when I am in view, uh, cry out, here's a friend for you, Bill, and if you don't, I'll do this. And with that, he gave me a twitch, and I thought, well, uh, give me a faint. Between this and that, I was so utterly terrified of the blind beggar that I forgot my terror of the captain, and as I opened the parlor door, cried out the words that he had ordered in a trembling voice. The poor captain eh, raised his eyes, and at one look, uh, the rum went out of him and left him staring sober. The expression of his face was not so much of terror as of mortal sickness. Oh, he made a movement to rise, but I do not believe he had enough force left in his body. Uh, now, Bill, sit where you are, said the beggar. If I can't see, I can't hear a finger stirring. Business is business. Hold out your left hand, boy. Take his left hand by the wrist and bring it near to my right. Well, we both paid him to the letter, and I saw him pass something from the hollow of his hand that held a stick to the palm of his captain's, and when he, and he closed it upon it instantly. And now that's done, said the blind man. With these words, he suddenly left hold of me, and, and with incredible accuracy and nimbleness, stepped out of the parlor and into the road, where, as I stood motionless, I could hear his stick go tap, 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 and in the distance... It was with some time before uh, either I or the captain seemed to gather our senses, but at length, and at about the same moment, I released his wrist, uh, which I was still holding, and he drew in his hand and looked sharply into the palm. Ten o'clock, he cried. Six hours. We'll do them yet, he sprang to his feet. Even as he did so, he reeled, put his hand to his throat, stood swaying for a moment, and then, with a particular sound, fell from the whole height of his face foremost to the floor. I ran at him once, called my mother, uh, but haste was all in vain. The captain had been struck dead by thundering apoplexy. It is a curious thing to understand, for I had certainly never uh, liked the man, uh, though of late I had begun to pity him, uh, but as soon as I saw that he was dead, I burst into a flood of tears, and it was the second death I had known, and the sorrow of the first was still fresh in my heart. Well, that's a good way to end these chapters. Uh, with that, why don't we go down to the smoking room and, uh, oh, I don't know, smoke a cigarette and uh, discuss what we just read. Oh, uh, there you are. Why don't you uh, take a seat? Yeah, well, yeah, do you see the baboon's skull there on the coffee table before you? Go ahead, remove the top half of its cranium, and you can find that it's filled with cigarettes. Go on, enjoy one. As we talk about what the hell we just read, as stolen from Spark Notes, um, the first three chapters start off with Jim Hawkins, a young boy, being told to tell the story of his adventures. He makes sure to leave out the island's location, since there is still treasure buried there, which sets the tone for his purpose and the nature of this story. Jim, uh, doing his hero's journey, is a perfect protagonist with uh, how young he is. Seeing the events and the characters from his point of view shows us the quote-unquote magic and quote-unquote wonder of the pirating universe through the eyes of a child who would find it romantic and exciting. Though the author offers details that cast a shadow over that, like the constant drinking, the intimidating the people at the bar with horrible stories and songs and swearing. Uh, so instead of showing us the gritty, immature, and violent underworld that we actually kind of experience in that, uh, we still see them as something to aspire to through his young eyes. Because he doesn't seem to get upset or scared. I mean, he kind of gets scared. He gets scared, but he keeps coming back. Because the guy offers him money and uh, just kind of is like a, a little bit of a kind of a gruff imp, if that's a phrase you can use. Uh, so he kind of likes it. He's still drawn in. Uh, I never finished reading this story before. I was forced to read it in middle school, and I hated it, so I barely passed that class. Uh, but I imagine that um, uh, young Jim Hawkins will mature. 
and maybe start to see these pirates for what they really are towards the uh, end of the book. I guess we'll just find that out together. But uh, in the meantime, in these early chapters, we see that the world that Jim is coming from, with a safe environment of professional adults like his father and the doctor, and the intrusion of a darker world of pirates. Oh, the murder. Oh, and they drink a lot and they swear. Uh, there's a conflict early on between these two worlds uh, when Livesey uh, can calmly ignore Billy when he's uh, threatening him. And uh, this is where I can hopefully steal from the book, uh, from Spark Notes. Uh, quote, This scene is an early exploration of one of Stevenson's central ideas in the novel, the frequent opposition between social lawfulness and personal charisma. Unquote. So there you go. I'm, a, I'm admitting I stole that because it was kind of good. I saw that. I'm like, oh, God, how do I reword that? I can't. I'm just going to steal it. So uh, there you go. We're in the beginning of this book where a little boy is going to get swept up into the exciting, sensual world of pirates. Uh, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of cliches. I refuse to read any of this in a pirate voice. Uh, so uh, next week, I will continue reading more chapters from this book. I hope to see you then. Ah, uh, well, it appears you found me in the part of the podcast I hate the most where I tell you all about the places on the internet where you can find me. You can tell I hate this because of the sound effects making it sound like a stormy night uh, in the drawing room of the damned. Now, there's there's that. Uh, uh, I, are you cool? I like cool people. It's the reason why I got involved in this business to begin with, just to meet cool people. Not losers. So if you're cool, uh, feel free to go over to my website, uh, nuzzlehouse.com. But uh, if you go there, you get to hear some of the other stuff that uh, I and my wife work on. Like uh, the Radio Mystery Theater show, where we try to recreate uh, the same show that used to be on in the 70s, but they don't make any episodes anymore. So we make our own, and we just steal all their commercials. Uh, and also, just stay in the curious mind, uh, we made a Christmas album. If you go to our link tree, you can see that we made a Christmas album. It's the first thing we did after getting married, which I think everyone should do when they get married, is start talking about the Christmas album they're going to make. And we're working on a new show where we give relationship advice by reading a Paranormal Smut. And since, uh, since I think you might be cool, you can always just email me directly. Glenn.nuzzles at gmail.com but don't, uh, don't email if you're a, a nerdlinger or a dork. Now, back to business. I can't believe I drank all of them already. There's gotta be one left.